If you think about US Airways, I'm sure many of you immediately think about Sully and US Airways Flight 1549 that miraculously landed on the Hudson River. But I would argue that most of you probably haven't heard about a US Airways flight that was even shorter than Sully's emergency landing. Today I bring you the story of US Airways Flight 1702 that ended up like this. Let's find out what happened here. Welcome to Airspace. On March 13, 2014, a US Airways Airbus A320 was preparing for departure in Philadelphia. That day, the flight deck was occupied by two very experienced pilots, a 61-year-old captain as well as a 62-year-old first officer. The two had expected and briefed the departure from Philadelphia's runway 27 left. Soon, all preparations were finished, the aircraft taxied to the runway and received clearance to take off. All seemed normal from the outside as the A320 accelerated and eventually started raising its nose into the cold evening sky. But then something strange happened. Just as it looked as if the plane was about to lift off, the A320's nose suddenly dropped back to the runway abruptly. Then the aircraft bounced into the air, climbed above the runway, just to slam back down seconds later. It then slid to a halt, first on, then off the runway, with its nose gear collapsing in the process. An evacuation was quickly started. What on earth happened here? Such a rejected takeoff is highly unusual. Had the pilot saved the plane by rejecting at the last second and therefore not taking the aircraft up into the skies? The reality is very different and a strong reminder of how flawed human performance can be sometimes. Let's go back to about 30 minutes before the failed takeoff, to the time when the crew was preparing the aircraft for their flight. On the day of the accident, this first flight would see the captain at the controls, with the first officer as assisting pilot. On the ground, the captain coordinated various tasks while the first officer programmed the flight management system with their flight route and takeoff calculation data. When the captain returned to the cockpit, the pilots discussed their route as well as their intended takeoff performance parameters. When the doors of the A320 were closed a few minutes later, the plane was pushed back and taxied to runway 27 left as intended. Soon, the pilots received clearance to line up onto said runway. As they did so, the captain suddenly realized that the first officer had inserted the wrong departure runway into the flight management system. Instead of the intended runway 27 left, it indicated that it was programmed for runway 27 right. The captain asked the first officer to quickly insert the correct departure data into the system as he lined the aircraft up with the runway. This action was completed a few seconds later and the crew thought themselves to be ready for departure. Now, to understand the following sequence, let's take a brief look at how a takeoff actually works. Every takeoff maneuver needs to be thoroughly calculated to assure the highest level of safety for the aircraft and its occupants. In order to perform a takeoff, three speeds must be calculated, each abbreviated with a V, which stands for velocity. First, there is V1. This speed is also called the decision speed. Once the aircraft reaches V1, a takeoff can no longer be rejected in a safe manner without overrunning the runway. Therefore, for all failures that occur after V1, a takeoff has to be completed. That includes severe failures and engine failures. The second speed is called VR, or the rotate speed. At this speed, the pilot will raise the plane's nose to the sky so that the aircraft will lift off. Most of the time, it is very close to V1, but large splits are also possible in certain circumstances. And lastly, there is V2, the safe climb speed. It is used in case of an engine failure to climb away safely. That is with a climb rate that clears all obstacles in the flight path after takeoff. There's also another fact that many people don't know. Most takeoffs are not conducted using the maximum available thrust of the engines. Reducing the thrust by a few percent reduces the fuel burn and the engine wear and therefore maintenance costs greatly. A safe takeoff can usually still be performed at reduced thrust levels. If not, maximum thrust is of course used. This reduced thrust setting is called a flex. To obtain all these speeds and the flex I described above, most airlines use some form of a takeoff performance application on a tablet or computer. The current prevailing weather and runway can be entered and the program will return the optimum speeds and flex values for the upcoming takeoff. The flex value is given as a temperature. All these speeds and the flex temperature are then entered into the flight management system. Now, you might be wondering why on earth is flex given as a temperature? An entire accurate explanation would fill a video, so I'll just give you the short version. 
By entering a flex temperature, one is actually telling the engine's computers that this temperature, for example 68 degrees, is prevailing outside. That is, if you will, a little swindle, because outside it obviously isn't 68 degrees Celsius. This would be very hot, and the engine therefore limits its maximum thrust to protect itself, which results in a lower thrust on takeoff. I know, it's a bit strange. Here is how a complete takeoff setup looks in the A320. Now, let's go back to US Airways Flight 1702 that had just lined up on the runway. After the captain had discovered the wrong departure route in the flight management system, the first officer dutifully reprogrammed the correct one into it. Doing this automatically cleared the takeoff performance data, since these calculations are specific to every runway. They need to be redone in case of a runway change. The flight management system also notifies the pilots in that case with a message printed in amber that reads Check takeoff data. But for some reason, the co pilot omitted this. A few seconds later, the flight received takeoff clearance and the captain advanced the thrust levers to the flex position on the throttle quadrant, right here. This is the correct action to initiate the takeoff with reduced thrust. The thing is, this will only work if a flex temperature is entered on the takeoff page of the flight management system. In this case, however, the takeoff page had been cleared when the first officer entered a new departure route. Therefore, the A320's warning computers now generated a warning, thrust levers not set, since the engine controllers did not know what thrust to set with the flex temperature missing. Instead of the required flex thrust, the engines now delivered another thrust value that is somewhere between normal climb and maximum power. Confused, the captain said they are set and continued to take off. Now, several events happened in quick succession. First, the oral retard alert started sounding continuously. No, this is not an insult, but a reminder to reduce or retard the thrust levers when landing. This alert is misplaced on takeoff and a result of the incorrect thrust setting. Confused, the captain asked the first officer, what did you do? You didn't load, we lost everything. Quickly, the first officer apologized and the captain said, we'll get that straight once you get in the air. Their displays no longer showed the target values for V1, VR and V2. Speed set would have been very much essential for a safe takeoff. All this happened while the aircraft was still hurtling down the runway. When the A320 reached a speed of 164 knots, the captain raised the nose of the aircraft to get airborne. But just as he did so, he changed his mind. At this very moment, he now felt that the aircraft was not safe to fly. So, after ignoring all previous warnings and procedures, he put the thrust levers to idle and slammed the nose wheel back to the runway hard. The impact of the nose wheel had the opposite of the intended effect. It bounced off, lifting the nose of the aircraft higher. Since the A320 carried a lot of momentum, it now became airborne and climbed to 15 feet above the runway, while the engines went down to idle. It quickly bled off speed and started coming down while the captain provided erratic inputs that included full nose up and full nose down commands in rapid succession. After just a few seconds, the plane came down hard, tail first, then with the main landing gear, and in one fast motion, also violently with the nose landing gear. The latter fractured on impact and the aircraft slid to a halt first on, then off runway 27 left. An airport surveillance camera captured a breathtaking takeoff rejection attempt of the aircraft. Watch closely in the upper left corner. After the plane had stopped, the crew quickly initiated an evacuation. The rear slides could not be used since the aircraft's tail was up so high in the air. Everyone made it out uninjured and several passengers even took videos of the evacuation. The investigation that followed was finished quickly, since the sequence of events was pretty obvious. At the gate, a departure route that originated from a wrong runway was entered. When this mistake was rectified after lining up on the correct runway, the first officer forgot to enter the new takeoff performance data. When the captain then tried to set the thrust to the flex setting, the computers had no reference and issued a thrust not set warning. At this point, the takeoff could have very easily been saved by simply advancing the thrust levers to the maximum setting. This would have cleared all warnings and the takeoff could have been performed that would have been safe with just minimal downsides. It would maybe have used 50 to 100 kilograms more fuel, a negligible amount considering the fuel burn of an entire flight which usually amounts to multiple tons. But of course, the takeoff could also have been rejected at that stage. Instead, the captain chose to continue the takeoff without reference speeds, with warnings blaring and while berating his first officer. 
As the plane reached 164 knots, about 10 knots above the correct rotation speed, the captain lifted the nose of the plane. At this point, as I said, safe flight could have easily been possible. The entire takeoff maneuver would not have been nice, but the crew had a working plane, and as soon as they would have been airborne, there would not have been any further consequences. Instead, the captain chose to do something that every pilot knows is a cardinal sin. He rejected the takeoff after V1. To be fair, yes, he didn't know the exact value of V1, since it was no longer displayed on his instruments. But then again, common V1 speeds are usually between 110 and 145 knots, and this is something the captain should have known, especially given his almost 40 years of piloting experience. So, what could this crew have done better? Well, there would have been two options. Either they could have just advanced the thrust levers to full power, which would have cleared all warnings, or they could have simply rejected the takeoff, which probably would have been the better option. They could then have re-entered the correct departure route, speeds and flex value, and have been underway 15 minutes later. Instead, the aircraft had to undergo costly repairs. I'm amazed that it survived the ordeal. It continued to fly for US Airways until it was finally scrapped in January 2021. As for the pilots, I don't know their fate since US Airways did not want to disclose this info back then for privacy reasons. So this was the story of US Airways Flight 1702. If you liked the video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel and activate the bell icon. You know the drill. Thank you all for watching and see you in the next one.